Good morning, friends. You may be seated. Littles can go with Miss Cheryl and children with Mother Wendy. And uh, Mother Wendy said that children, be good to bring your jacket along, bring your coat along. Um, some kind of adventure is going to be happening there. So, hey, let's pray. Lord, we, we bless you this morning and thank you and just pray would you let us uh, be with you right now. Give us the opportunity to be with you, to see you, to hear you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So today is St. Patrick's Day. And of all the things attributed to St. Patrick, many of them true, and some of them maybe not quite as true, of all the things attributed to St. Patrick, maybe one of the most amazing and most important is perhaps something you may not have heard before. Patrick is, as best I know, he's attributed with the third Christian witness against slavery in history. The first Christian witness against slavery is the New Testament. It's not true that the New Testament is okay with slavery. It is true that the little churches didn't have any power to end it, so in certain ways they had to accommodate the social reality that was around them, but that's not the same thing as approving of it. If you know how to read Paul's letter to Philemon, if you know culturally how that read in that moment, you know that Paul has left him no choice. He will be releasing the slave when he gets the letter. We also know in the, in the Apocalypse, the book of true seeing, the last book in the scriptures, there's a really wonderful little line where it says there's a judgment that will be upon those who traffic in human souls. It's also true that slaves who were in the churches because they weren't able socially to get freed, they were allowed to be elders because their standing was as people who are in Christ with the Spirit. So they could be elders in those communities. It's true that the earliest Christian communities, when people among them who were socially slaves died, and when they were buried, their tombstones were counterculturally not marked as those of slaves. Because now they were free, and no one owned them. Their ontology, their being, had always come from the Imago Dei not from who it was said that they were or where they slotted in. So that was not marked. So the, the first Christian witness against slavery is just flat out the New Testament itself. Hallelujah, right? We got we to gotta sort that out. We just sort that out. That needs to be known. The second one is Gregory of Nyssa. Anybody know who Gregory of Nyssa was? So Gregory of Nyssa is one of the three Cappadocians. Gregory of Nyssa, his brother Basil, and Gregory of Nazianzus. And so the whole Jesus thing happens, right? Like Jesus happens and people go, oh my word, I've never seen anyone like that. And then he dies and he comes back to life. And really the church then for a couple hundred years is saying, how do we talk about this? How do we understand this? This was, wow, like he's God, but he's us. And it takes a while to wrestle through this. And finally, in the Council of Nicaea, they, they come to the agreement in the language that he's fully divine and fully human. Two natures, one person, no division. Simple and true. It's Gregory, Basil, and Gregory who sit together with their big Greek brains, philosophical brains, and find a way to put this. Gregory of Nyssa was a part of a family where Basil was his brother and Macrina was his sister. Basil and Gregory are considered super theologians, and they both said Macrina was the smartest of the three. It's an amazing family. Basil spoke powerfully for the poor. He got in trouble for it. He spoke so strongly for the poor. Macrina would go out and amongst the, the trash heaps where unwanted infants after birth would be deposited in the night, she would go out with others and collect them and care for them. And Gregory wrote in the 300s the second Christian statement against slavery. So Gregory got there kind of philosophically. Patrick got there by a very different route. 
Patrick got there personally. In the 400s, Patrick was a young teenager living in England in a family that was pretty well off. They were in a, in a kind of a Roman enclave, Roman society beginning to happen in England, and they were part of that. But he was out and about one day, and he got captured by some Irish hooligans who drug him away, put him on a ship, and he was trafficked. He was taken to Ireland. He was sold into slavery. He was hauled off to the hinterland of the inland, and he had literally nothing but the clothes that were on his back when he was captured. And he was put out in the middle of nowhere, and he was watching sheep. He had almost nothing to eat. His clothes were beginning to wear through. And he literally was alone, and he would spend the days praying and praying and praying. And finally, he had the sense that someone was hearing that and that there was someone on the other end and there was someone who was with him. And one night he had a dream. This is all of you, this story is fantastic. It's all Patrick tells it in his confessions, which is kind of the language back then for his, his story, his autobiography. So Patrick has a dream one night and he hears the voice of God saying, go to the coast. And, you, and he sees a ship that will take him. He has no money, he has no nothing, and he flees. And he makes it by foot all the way to the coast. And there's a ship there. And he goes and he looks a sight, and, you know, he has no money. And, the, and he talks to the captain, and the captain says, okay, come on. And they take him back to England. Can you imagine the party when he is restored to his family at home? And things are good, and things are great. But then Patrick begins to remember others back in Ireland. Now, Roman culture, for good or for ill, was, was spreading around in England, right? You guys know the, the Monty Python scene, right? Like, um, you know, the Romans, right? What have they ever done for us? Well, I mean, there's roads and there, right? You know that scene, right? I mean, besides all that stuff. So it's a mixed bag, right? Ireland doesn't have any of that going on. Ireland has braggart culture. Small tribes where the biggest, baddest, bulliest, braggartest dude or woman, they were, they were if it was a big, loud, charismatic woman, she, she'd be the, the chieftainess, whatever the right word is for that, right? The chieftain of the little tribes. And they're forever going at each other, you know, hammer and tong, sword and spear. And it's, it's a, it, makes, it makes for good authors. It makes for great music. Because of the pain, it hurts. It's not a great way to live everyday life. It's romantic, and it makes good stories, but it doesn't make happy everyday life. So Patrick begins to remember all these other people who are in those difficult places. He goes to sleep one night. He has another dream, and in this dream, there are Irish faces calling out to him, come and help us. So he breaks the news to his parents. He goes to France. He trains to be a priest. And then lo and behold, he goes back to the place where he was trafficked. Patrick goes back of his own free will to Ireland where he was trafficked. He is unstoppable. He has a remarkable confidence in God. He has been delivered. He has suffered. He has prayed. He has seen God deliver him. And he has an undying confidence in God. And so he goes back. He knows that the God that he knows is different from the Irish pantheon. There's a fabulous book that tells his story. It's a book called How the Irish Saved Civilizations. I don't know, probably came out in the 90s or something by Thomas Cahill. It's a fantastic book. Cahill, in the story, tries to describe the culture that Patrick went back to by talking about a vision that affected all these tribal troops. They're out for a big battle, and they're, you know, they're one's camped over here and one's camped over there. And one group, one night, has this collective vision of the pantheon, the gods they believed in, coming to visit them, and they're so terrified that some of them die. Because the the pantheon they believed in is is similar to some of Hinduism, 
some of the spirits and some of the gods are really, really malevolent. And they're out to get you. So when they imagine the gods coming among them, these soldier guys are scared so much that some of them die. Patrick goes in with confidence because he knows that the living God is a God who loves people. And Patrick knows that the people will respond to this because who wouldn't? So he has incredible confidence in God. Patrick and the communities that formed around him and his disciples, they, it has to be said, they loved Lent. They were, they were proper term, highly ascetical. They did a lot of fasting. They did a lot of scripture memorization and daily prayer. They were, if you just read their stuff with no context, you're sort of like, whoa, I don't know. They were ascetic, man. They were into it. They're into it because they are hungry. They're hungry to displace all that stuff about the gods who terrify them, to displace all that stuff that they've grown up with where you respond to someone by clubbing them over the head. They're hungry to get rewired. And they're trying to get rewired to the core depths of their being. So they fast to get you know, into their system. They fast to get rewired, to change the direction of their appetites, that they'll be in charge of their appetites so their appetite being in charge of them. And then maybe they can get in charge of their anger instead of their anger being in charge of them. And they pray. And they are deeply committed to this stuff. But they're not dour. They're communities of beauty. These great gilded manuscripts that they produce, stunning. You can see them in museums, you know, anywhere. Museums love it. They can get a a, a bit of the Book of Kells or these various ones. There's several. You know, these stunning gilded manuscripts, especially gospel manuscripts. They wrote poetry. They loved stories. They loved song. They were deeply in touch with nature. They loved to be outdoors. They prayed outdoors. They talked about God being strong as the rock and God's love being as deep as the sea and God's freedom being like the wind. They were, they just, they were in it. There were communities where women were oftentimes the leader. Women's roles and their leadership were recognized early in these communities. These were interesting, creative, amazing Christian communities. And they grew up out of Patrick's suffering and his core life story. It's worth keeping St. Patrick's Day, yeah? Maybe not with green, I mean, I don't, green beer or whatever, but I mean, how does that happen? Anyway, let's change gears a little bit. Patrick caught the core thing about Jesus and his way. And that's what we heard in our scripture today. Today is an unusual confluence. It's the commemoration of St. Patrick, and it's the fifth Sunday of Lent. And the fifth Sunday of Lent is when we enter into deep Lent. And it's, this is Passion Sunday. Next week is Palm Sunday. And then we're in it. And then it's Tenebrae and Monday Thursday and Good Friday before we break through to Easter. So it's deep. It's deep stuff. And today just happens to be that these two fall together. Patrick got it. He would be very comfortable with this day of Passion Sunday, and that shaped him. The scripture this morning is an interesting one. It's a very unusual little moment. There are these Greeks who are interested in God. They're interested in Yahweh, and they've come to the festival, and they said, we want to see Jesus. Now, if you're reading along in the gospel and you come to this, what do you expect happens next? What do you expect happens next? Have you ever had this moment, right? You're reading along and you go, there are these Greeks, they say, we want, sir, we want to see Jesus. What happens next? Of course you take, of course Jesus is like, oh, great, Greeks, bring them on. Like new people, a bubble into a whole different world. I mean, that's when I've ever read that passage, that's what I'm thinking comes next, right? 
Of course, they're gonna, this is going to be great. This is going to be a story about how Jesus touched some Greeks, and then they went back and they you know, spread the gospel. That's what's going to happen. That doesn't happen at all. Jesus starts talking about something seemingly irrelevant. It's unexpected. Why? Greeks were famous in that world for being the people who think it out. They make teeny-weeny minute distinctions. And when we needed them to do that in the Council of Nicaea, Gregory and Basil and Gregory did it, and hallelujah, praise the Lord, they did. It was all his plan. And this moment is not set for that. This moment, Jesus is turning to Jerusalem, and his mind is occupied with what's going to happen when he gets there. And he just, he, just, he just can't sit down and do philosophical abstraction today. So he says, yeah, okay, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. As he says, I'm going to be glorified, my hour is here. His glory is going to be his cross. Jesus says that his hour, the purpose of his being, the, the culmination of the purpose of his being is his cross, which, which is then his resurrection, but you have to pass through the one to get to the other. He says it's his glory that he goes to the cross. So he says, Father, glorify your name. In other words, I'm willing. I'm going to walk into it. Counterintuitive. It gets worse. Jesus says, this is the way that the ruler of this world will be judged. That is as much social as it is spiritual because they're all mixed together. Jesus is saying, my way of self-giving love is what I'm sowing into the world. And it is counter to the assumptions of early medieval braggart culture, of efficiency over humanity, of all kinds of things that we humans, when we make our societies, assume. Power is good. Beauty makes someone better. Might makes right. All the things we just sort of naturally live in. The kinds of stuff that oftentimes doesn't need to be named because it's so real that we don't even realize it's the water we're swimming in. And Jesus says, hold on a minute. This world's going to be judged when I choose in self-giving love to go to the cross and I open up a whole different kind of energy. You guys remember Jake Stum? Remember Pastor Reverend Jake? The head of ARDF, he's with us back in the summer. He's a great, great guy, big, big Tennessee, big fellow with a beard. You remember Jake? Jake turned me on to this book. It's by a Czech Catholic priest. And this is the first chapter. In the first chapter, this, this guy is, he's talking about how he finds uh, wonder, goodness, truth in all cultures, all peoples. He's traveled, he's done a lot of study, and he says, I'm neither all-knowing nor all-seeing. I cannot produce final and infallible judgments about others and their personal beliefs because I cannot see into their hearts or catch a glimpse of the final end and goal of their journey. No one can rid me of the hope that the God of the others is in the final analysis also my God, Because the God I believe in is also the God of those who do not know the name by which I call God. There's only one God, right? But in the same breath, I add and declare. So he's saying, yeah, I get it. I'm broad. You know, talk to me. Be who you are. Let's talk. Let me me learn from you. Learn from me, whatever. In the same breath, I add and declare. For me, there is no other path or other gate to God than that which is opened by a wounded hand and a pierced heart. I am unable to exclaim, my Lord and my God, until I see the wound that pierced the heart. If credere, the Latin is derived from cor dare, dare, giving one's heart, to believe, if believing is giving one's heart, then my heart and my faith belong only to the God who has wounds to show. My faith is at one with my love, and no one can rid me of my love for the crucified. 
which is my response to his love for me. Can anything cut me off from the love of Christ? Can anything cut me off from that love whose proof of identity is its wounds? I am incapable of uttering the words, my God, unless I see the wounds. However radiant a religious vision might be, if it lacks the scars left by the nails, I would be hard-pressed in spite of my goodwill to rid myself of my misgivings that it might be an illusion or a projection of my own desires or even the Antichrist. My God is a wounded God. It's good, huh? That last sentence is long. Do you, do you need it again or did you get it? However radiant a religious vision might be, if it lacks the scars left by the nails, I would be hard-pressed, in spite of my goodwill, to rid myself of my misgivings, that it might be an illusion, or a projection of my own desires, or even the Antichrist. My God is a wounded God. Friends, I invite you this morning. We've covered a lot of ground. I just invite you to, in your heart and soul, to sit with the Lord for a couple minutes and um, whatever has, has touched you, just tell him that. Thank Jesus for walking all the way to the cross, for being the wounded God and know that he loves you. Take a few minutes to, to be with him.